This is Case Closed, Crime Stories from the Golden Age of Radio. Welcome back to Case Closed, your weekly hour of old-time radio crime, which you can find every Wednesday at relicradio.com. Our first story this week comes from Rogue's Gallery. We'll hear Special Added Attraction, his episode from January 31st, 1946. After that, it's This Is Your FBI and the Night of Terror. That episode aired September 27th, 1946. The S.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Fowl as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Oh, don't look at me like that. Just because my shirt is half torn off and my face is scratched and my necktie is under my ear, I just walked into a store to buy a pair of socks right in the middle of a sale of nylons. <laughs> oh, women. Long red fingernails, staring eyes, pushing, clawing, tall elbows and high heels. Yeah. Anybody know where I can trade my pair of nylons for a white shirt? Oh, well. As I returned from this shopping expedition and was looking on the world at large with a jaundiced eye, I walked into my office and found this suit sitting there, overflowing with a large and robust gentleman with a toothy smile and the manner of a man who was just meeting an old school chum after 40 years of separation. I cringed a little as he rushed happily toward me with a hand like the business end of a claw machine clutching at mine. I'd never seen him before. Mr. Rogue, you are Mr. Rogue. Are you not the celebrated investigator? Yes, that's right. Mr. Rogue, I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. Very happy. My name is Price. Pop Price, I'm called by those who know me. I'll have a chair, Mr. Price. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I've called on you, Mr. Rogue, to retain your services. Uh, Mr. Price, how about starting at the beginning now? When you get through with your end of the story, I'll tell you mine. It'll be a quick yes or no. Man, a few words that I like. Well, I'll be brief. I realize that you're a busy man, Mr. Rogue. Yes, sure. Go on. I am business manager for the Farrington Brothers Circus, the world's greatest show. You've seen the circus, of course, been running here for three weeks at the Coliseum. Well, no, I haven't, but I... Then you missed something, sir. You've never seen Carlotta the Magnificent, the world's premier aerialist, the only woman in the world who ever attempted to swing through the air between two flying trapezes, turning four complete somersaults in midair, defying death without even the security of a Beneath her. It's a breathtaking sight, road, positively breathtaking. Now, look, mister, if you're selling tickets to the circus, I, I don't came think... here to employ you, Rogue, in your professional capacity to prevent a murder. Somebody is going to attempt to murder one of the circus leading luminaries during tonight's performance. Rogue, somebody has threatened to murder Carlotta the Magnificent. No kidding. It's a little unusual for murderers to issue invitations. Well, here it is, Rogue, the death threat. Mm. Oh. Can't get much out of that. Pasted on the back of a circus handbill. Letters cut from newspaper headlines. You'll die during tonight's performance. <laughs> now, Pop, isn't that a little dramatic? How was the note delivered? It was on her makeup table this morning. Huh? Hmm. Do you have any enemies in the show? Well, frankly, Rogue, Carlotta is, well, she's the kind of a personality that makes enemies. She's uh, very sure of herself, exceedingly conceited. As a matter of fact, she's what you would probably call an 18-carat died in the wool. Oh, oh, fine. He's as strong as an ox, as smart as a fox, as mean as a snake, and as brave as a lion. She's 38, but she still considers herself a fatal beauty. As a matter of fact, she's a fine-looking woman, wonderful figure, big brown eyes. Sounds like a fascinating character. Who would want to kill her? In strict confidence, rogue, almost anybody who's ever had anything to do with her. Mm. Well, that narrows it down a little. Have you told the police about this threatening note? Yes, I told them, and I've told the newspapers. Oh, I knew you wouldn't want to leave them out. You know what I think, Pop? I think this whole thing is a press agent's dream. Lots of free publicity. Believe me, Mr. Rogue, you are wrong. Tonight only. Tonight only a special added attraction. See the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent, along with the greatest show on earth. All at the regular price. <laughs> oh, Pop, thanks for coming in, but I... Just I, a I... minute, Mr. Rogue. I have here something which I think might change your mind by way of a retainer. Oh, all that stuff. Well, that does help to convince me you're on the level. Shall we say $500? That's a nice round figure. Here you are, and here are two passes to the circus tonight. I'll see you there. Rogue, you must prevent that murder. Well, 
that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment. For now, here's Jim Doyle. I'd like to say something to the ladies. You know that one of the rules of modern life is perfect cleanliness. For instance, women years ago would be horrified at the thought of washing their hair every day, as many of our Hollywood stars do. But then they didn't have Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo in those days. If they had, I'll wager they would have used it frequently. For Fitch's saponified shampoo always leaves the hair lustrous and easy to set. Made from pure vegetable and mild coconut oils, it won't dry the hair or make it harsh feeling. It cleanses thoroughly, too, for it makes loads of fluffy lather even in hard water. This lather whisks away every bit of dust and dirt, leaves your hair fragrant and sparkling clean. Ask for a professional application of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo at your beauty or barber shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Ordinarily, I wouldn't go to the circus, even if the elephants carried water for me. But when Pop Price, the business manager of the Farrington Brothers Circus, paid me five bills to prevent the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent, I called Betty Callahan at her newspaper and asked her to attend the performance with me that evening. We went early. We wanted to interview the great Carlotta before the big show started. This press agent was in today with a story on that threatening note. Mr. Addison had him come out of the office. Don't walk so fast, Richard. Wait a minute. He said no circus press agent was going to chisel any free space from our people with a mall keeps and gag like that. Yeah. Well, he's probably right. Oh, excuse me, Sonny. I'll tell you, we'll take him some pink lemonade and some cotton candy when we go back. <laughs> That'll make him happy, huh? Oh, sure. I'd better go back with a murder story if I have to commit it myself. Oh, really? Hey, buddy. Yeah? Where do I find Carlotta the Magnificent? What do you want with her? We're from a newspaper. We want to interview her. About that death threat she got today? Yeah. How did you know about it? Who doesn't? Everybody in the show is hoping. You mean they're hoping she'll be killed? We can dream, can't we? Carlotta's the worst nuisance that ever hit the circus business. I've been in this racket 20 years. I never knew a dame who could make so many people hate her so much. She's a genius. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You stutter a little bit there, don't you? Sorry. Where do we find this nobody's sweetheart? You're on the right track. Last dressing room in this row. This circus must think a lot of hot stuff. Look at the size of that star on her door. Yeah. Now, Betty, I'm going to tell her I'm a reporter. Might be able to get more out of it. All right. What do you want? A word from the evening bulletin. Oh, oh, you're from the press. I love the press. Did you bring a photographer with you? Come in. The photographer will be along later. Oh, please, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, This young man is my manager, Frank Davis. Uh, Hello, Mr. Davis. How are you? Here, take this chair, miss. Oh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Now, you want to ask me some questions, no? Why, yes, Carlotta. If it isn't too much trouble, uh, tell me... What is your last name? I am Carlotta. Uh, do we have to have this young lady here? I would like to talk to you alone. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Miss Betty Callahan. She's also on the paper. My name is Richard Rogue. Oh, you are a very handsome man, Mr. Rogue. You are strong, no? No, well, I've managed to drag myself around. <laughs> but uh, let's, uh, let's talk about you, Carlotta. Uh, could we put this interview off until after the performance tonight, Mr. Rogue? Perhaps we could have dinner, you and I. You're not very worried about the death threat, are you? Me? Oh, no. Why should I worry? It's professional jealousy, that is all. Somebody is jealous of Carlotta the Magnificent. Someone who is less beautiful, less talented. That could be almost anybody. They're all jealous, aren't they, Frank? Why shouldn't they be? Believe me, Mr. Rogue, Carlotta's the queen of them all. I've seen all of them in the last five years, and Carlotta here's the payoff. There's never been anyone within a mile of it. Oh, Frank. Frank is such a sweet boy. He loves me. But I am tired. I am weary. Tonight I leave the circus. Well, when did you decide that? I decided two weeks ago. 
This is my last night as a performer. The circus world loses its greatest attraction after tonight's performance. Isn't that tragic? Uh, <clears throat> uh, Carlotta, does Pop Price know of your decision? Price? Oh, of course he knows. His heart is breaking. What will his show be without Carlotta Magnificent? What will it be? Answer me. I don't know. It will be nothing. Oh, yeah. Well, now, now look, uh, what did you do when you found that threatening note? I turned the note over to Price. He turned it over to the police. Have you seen my act, Mr. Rogue? No. No? We're going to see it tonight, Carlotta. I am sensational. Well, uh, Carlotta, that note you received was lying here on your makeup table when you came in today, right? Yes. Young man, have you ever tried to do four somersaults a hundred feet in the air? Me? Without a net? Oh, now look, Carlotta, I, I want to know about that note. You don't want to get killed, do you? Look, I take a big swing, then four somersaults. Then I grab the trapeze on the other side. It is impossible. Unless you are me. This I have to say, Carlotta. Feel that muscle, Mr. Rock. Sure. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> hey, that's something. Yes. You're strong as in... Well, you're very strong. Yeah, and I've got the scars to prove it, haven't I, Carla? <laughs> yes. Frank and I were scoffling this morning. Look, open your mouth, sweetheart. There, the front tooth, I knocked it out. He is scuffling with Carlotta, who could tear him to pieces. Well, she didn't mean to do it, Mr. Rogue. We were just kidding around. <laughs> but I'm very feminine. I have a lovely figure. I dress very quietly on the street. You'll be proud of me when we go to dinner tonight, Mr. Rogue. Oh, I'm sure I will. Uh, look, Carlotta, I hate to be practical, but aren't you a little worried about the note? I mean, Pop Price is worried. Of course he's worried. He's afraid I'm leaving his show. You're on in ten minutes. Think. Pig. Don't pay any attention to him, Carlotta. I'll take care of him for you. Well, we'll have to hurry to our seats. We don't want to miss your performance. We'll be watching you, Carlotta. You will hurry. There will be a tremendous crowd tonight. This is Carlotta the Magnificent's last performance. Oh, kind of hard on the public, isn't it? Of course. I will see you after the performance, Hanson. Uh, thanks for coming back to see us, Rogue, and you too, Miss Callahan. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we'll see you later tonight, Carlotta. Oh, that she should live so long. <laughs> You know, Betty, I sometimes wonder if she really wants to talk to me after the show. You know, Richard, I feel that if I knew Carlotta the Magnificent just a little better, I'd kill her myself. She was absolutely brazen the way she flirted with you. And Dad Davis, he's young enough to be a son. She's a... she's a brazen flirt. Well, you could take some lessons from her, Betty. What? That's a girl who knows what she wants. On second thought, the two of you should make a wonderful couple. You could just sit around and talk to each other about each other and lead a life of great bliss. Well, I'll say one thing for Pop Price. He figured us in for some good seats. We're practically part of the show. Oh, I love circuses. I think they're exciting. Don't you, Richard? Sure, sure. The first honest work I ever did was carrying hay for the horses when the circus came to town. <laughs> Come to think of it, I guess it was the last honest work I ever did, too. Oh, Richard. Well, you can be an animal fan if you want to. Personally, I like the clowns. Oh, I like clowns, too. Yeah. <laughs> look, Richard. Look at that clown with a camera. Coming around here. See him? See him? Yeah. You mean the one dressed like a woman? <laughs> Look at that hat. <laughs> Isn't it ridiculous? You've got one just like it, haven't you? Oh, it's just like a man. The hat that clown has on has real fruit on it. Apples and oranges and grapefruit. <laughs> oh, look. <wow. laughs> At least the hat's practical. Did you see Mario grab that apple off and take a bite on it? Yes. Mario? Is that the famous Mario? Why don't you look at your program? I paid two bits for it. Oh. That clown in the red, white, and blue outfit with the putty nose and the big shoes is Mario. The highest paid clown in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Your Wonderful attention, one, please. About to enter. The Fallon Jim Robert Quiet. The greatest show on earth. Proudly presents the most sensational attraction ever to be seen on any stage, in any circus, or any theater. America's premier circus proudly presents 
the greatest aerialist of all time. Carlotta must have written I that herself. I call your attention to the fact. Jealous. Jealous. The of earth. And that the fine feet. No neck protects this intrepid artist from certain death in case of a mishap. Good. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, the feature attraction of this great show, Carlotta the Magnificent. Well, there comes your girlfriend. She's climbing up to a trapeze. Oh, a beautiful figure, hasn't she? Lovely. For her age. Ah, kitty, 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 kitty. Oh. Huh? Call out of the magnificent is ready to go. You'll soon find out whether you're covering a hoax or not. You don't think there's any doubt of it being a hoax, do you? Baby, I'm not sure of anything. Well, I wish this were over. So do I. Well, there she goes. Out of the trapeze. So she thinks a big sweeping. Looks like a tough way to make a buck, doesn't it? Well, why doesn't she jump? She's gathering momentum. Here come the somersaults, Penny. Richard, she's falling. Oh, Richard. Richard. Oh, 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 Turn to our story in just a moment. But now here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company, who wants to say something about one of his favorite subjects. That's right, Dick. Fitch's no-brush shaving cream is a favorite subject with me because men are always so pleased with it after they've tried it. Fitch's no-brush combines three different shaving ingredients into one easy-to-use cream. One of the ingredients, a special skin conditioner, helps prepare even a tender, sensitive face for a solid comfort shave. Fitch's No Brush also has a creamy, non-greasy texture. It helps the razor do the job in a hurry, even if your beard is tough. When you finished your shave, your face feels cool and refreshed and smooth as can be. For men who prefer lather, there's Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives lots of rich, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. Rinses off easily, too, leaving your face feeling smooth and pleasantly cool. Join the thousands who have found shaving pleasure through their switch to Fitch. Both Fitch's brush and Fitch's no brush shaving creams contain the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. And both come in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. And now Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I get invited to a lot of things, but this was the first time I was ever invited to watch a murder. As I sat there in my box seat at the circus and watched my self-elected dinner date fell out of the magnificent tumble to her death, I felt a great emptiness. I would probably have shown how I felt with much more gusto if Betty Callahan hadn't been practically tearing my arm off. The whole place was in a turmoil. And it took Betty and me quite a while to get down to where Lieutenant Urban was standing not far from the body. Please clear the arena. The upper exit's in leaving. Use the upper exits, please. I've got to call my city desk. What do I have, Betty? You can find a phone someplace down around the business offices. I'm going to talk to Urban. He looks a little upset. I'll be right back. Right. Take it easy now. Yes, I'll, I'll hurry. Uh-huh. What are you doing here? Well, I'm working for the corpse. What do you mean, working for the corpse? Well, it's simple. I was hired to keep this from happening. Who paid you? Pop Price, the head man of this outfit. How did it happen? Well, there are two 38 caliber bullets in the body. Somebody did some nice shooting. Oh. While the drums were rolling to cover up the noise, and the arena was darkened except for the spotlight on the victim. Wow. It's very nice planning. Now, stay right here, Rogue. We may want to talk with you later. Okay, I'm not going anyplace. Hello, Price. Mr. Rogue, may I speak with you a moment? Are you Price, business manager of this layout? Yes, this is horrible. Where were you when it happened? I was standing in the entry back there. I was worried. Oh, you were? Of course he was. He'd been warned that Carlotta was going to be killed at this performance. I can handle this, Rogue. I don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? She was leaving the show. 
This was to be her last performance, wasn't it? Yes, at least she intended to quit. She was always threatening to quit. And this time it looked like she meant it, eh? What would happen to your show if Carlotta left it? She was the star, wasn't she? Yes, she was the stellar attraction. Uh Uh-huh. So you'd have been in trouble. She was spotting you, wasn't she? And you took this way of getting even. That's a good theory, Urban. Thanks. Who was with you when it happened, Bryce? I was alone. Hmm, careless of you. Somebody punched a hole in your meal tea. Now, don't leave the premises. I want to talk with you later. Where's the dead woman's manager? I want to talk with him. He's in her dressing room. His name is Davis. Oh, he is, eh? Well, we'll call on him there. Come on, Rogue. Rachel, wait for me. Well, hurry up, Betty. Urban marches on. <laughs> Davis, we just want to ask some questions. You have been associated with Carlotta for five years. Who would have wanted to kill her? Believe me, Lieutenant Urban, if I knew I'd murder them. You don't know what Carlotta meant to me. I loved her. She had a lot of enemies, but... Just uh, name off a few of them, will you? Well, she had a run-in with the animal trainer, Cliss Stewart, the other day. And a big fight with Mario the Clown last week. And she and Pop Price weren't getting along very well. She threatened to choke him to death a few nights ago when she was threatening to quit and taunting him about it. And, well, it must have been one of them. They didn't understand Carlotta. They didn't know how to handle her. One of them killed her. Davis, uh, did she leave a will? Who gets her money? She had no money, Mr. Rogue. She spent it as fast as she got it. Sometimes a little faster. I tried to get her to save some money for the future. But she was too big-hearted. If she didn't have any dough, how come she was quitting a $1,000 a week job? The doctor ordered her to take it easy for a while. Her heart was acting up. I had it all fixed for a three-month rest in Mexico City. That's what she wanted. We found the gun, Lieutenant Urban. Where? Right by the third ring. The gun is a Smith and Weston, 38, and there were two ejected shells laying right by it. Well, it must have been dropped as soon as it was fired. That, that gun belongs to Mario, the clown. How do you know? I've seen it in his trunk a thousand times. So has everybody else in the circus. It's his, all right. It's got his initials on the butt. Mario, eh? That murdering skunk. I'm going to kill him for this. He did it. He shot Carlotta. Mario was standing in the ring, right about where the shot was fired, just a few minutes before the murder. That's right, Richard. We were watching him when the house lights dim for Carlotta's entrance. Yeah, that's his routine. I'm going to find him and... Davis, take it easy. I think the police can handle this. This is a personal thing. Give me that gun. Cut it off, Davis. Now, sit down. Take take it easy, Davis. Where's Mario's dressing room? Right next door. Uh, come on, Evan. Let's go see how funny this clown really is. Mario! Mario! Open up! This is the law! You know, he just may not be in there, Evan. Well, we'll see. Oh! Rich! He's dead! Hmm? Oh. Uh. No, I don't think so. He's been chloroformed. Smell it? Look, here's the bottle. He's still got the saturated cloth in his hand. Well, don't stand there waving at my face. Why would he chloroform himself? What makes you think he did? Murderers do funny things. Come on, let's get him out of here. Help me lift him, Rogue. Now, wait a minute, Irvin. Why don't you wait until he comes out of it? The way you're going at it, he'll be in the electric chair before he wakes up. You saw him right there at the edge of ring number three just before Carlotta was shot, didn't you, Rogue? Yes. Anybody else around him? No. And Carlotta was shot with Mario's gun. That's all I need. I'm taking him down and booking him for murder. Bet if your paper prints that story the way you see it, you're going to live to regret the day the printing press was invented. Urban's jumping the gun. Nobody ever went to that much trouble to frame themselves to the chair. Look, Richard, I'm your greatest admirer and all that. You're just being bullheaded. Nobody but Mario was near the spot where the gun and the spent cartridges were found. Your logic proves that he's the guilty man. Well, uh, somebody might have been impersonating Mario. Oh, that's ridiculous. Hey... I'm going back to the circus. There's one piece of evidence that everybody forgot to check. I'm 
not at all sure I like being alone in the menagerie at midnight. No. Well, hang on to my hand. We'll be in the main arena in just a minute. Thank goodness there's some lights in the arena. Yeah. It's an awful looking place in here, isn't it? <sighs> I don't imagine we're improving it much. No. Okay. All right. Now, uh, uh, here's the third ring. Mm-hmm. When we were watching Mario, he was right about here, wasn't he? Yeah. Over this way a little, I think. Well, it's, it's bound to be here someplace. Richard, what are you doing down on your hands and knees? I'm looking for a clue, baby. A clue that's going to send somebody up for murder. I'll show that urban guy how a really sharp investigator works. Oh, let's get out of here, Richard. Well, it's, it's got to be here someplace. Well, someplace. I've got it. I've got it, Betty. Drop it, Rogue. Huh? Drop it. Huh? Oh, okay. Okay, Davis. I always do as I'm told when I'm talking past a 45. You killed Carlotta, didn't you? Yes, but I'm not going to be arrested for it. Nobody I can prove I did it but you, Rogue. And you're not going to live to tell it. And neither is Miss Callahan here. All right, Miss Callahan, get over here. Over by Rogue. Oh. You think you can get away with killing us here? It's worth trying, isn't it? Well, okay. Look out, Betty. Look out. I didn't have anything to lose, so I rushed him. I may not be as strong as Collada was, but I was stronger than Frank Davis. And I had the advantage of some judo I'd picked up during a date with a hat check girl. I got the gun away from him and turned him over to Irvin. He admitted killing Collada. She was quitting the business and demanding an accounting of her cash. Davis had gambled most of it away. He knew Mario's routine, so he slipped him a Mickey, borrowed his costume and his gun, and took his place in the arena that evening. And you know, when he was impersonating Mario, and Betty and I watched him take a bite out of an apple, and he got off another clown's hat, remember? Well, I found the apple, and that's what convicted him. That front tooth Carlotta knocked out of his mouth gave him a kind of an uh, individualistic bite. It showed up as plain as the nose under Red's face in the part of the apple that was left. <laughs> Smart work, huh? Well, they executed Frank Davis for the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent. She was, uh, uh, she was quite a girl. Quite a girl. Betty didn't seem to like her, but, well, after all, women are all alike. Everyone you meet is different. You know what I mean? <laughs> This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget, uh, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about, uh, oh, about a girl, a boy, and a gun. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F I T C H.
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Fathers and mothers of America, upon the training you give your children depends the future of America. Our system of free enterprise, personal liberty, and democracy cannot exist without educated and enlightened citizens. In about 14 minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have some helpful suggestions for parents. If you wish to equip your children to take advantage of all the opportunities the future offers, don't miss this important message. Tonight's FBI file, The Night of Terror. This is 1946, the second year of the Atomic Age. And in almost every field of endeavor, man is breaking through new frontiers. But there is one field in which man has not changed his ways. The field of crime. Since the incident of the apple, there have been certain men who could not resist temptation. The temptation to advance themselves at the direct expense of the rest of society. Those men we call criminals. And those men down through the ages have committed the same crimes. Crimes ranging from robbery to murder. Tonight's file opens at a summer resort located on the shore of a lake near a large eastern city. In one of the cottages overlooking this lake, Two girls who work in the city are spending a hard-earned vacation. It is evening. One of the girls, Ann Madison, is dressing to go out. She calls to her friend. Ruthie! Yeah, honey? Do you mind if I wear your gold earrings? No, go ahead. Oh, thanks. What time is it? Uh, just 8.30. Oh, good. Hey, come on in here. Let's see how you look. Okay. Well? Well, you look lovely. <laughs> oh, thanks. <sighs> In fact, you look so lovely, I hate to see it wasted. Uh, what do you mean? You know what I mean, Ann. That guy you're going out with. Oh, now, don't start that again, Ruthie. You don't even know Al. Hmm. I know his reputation. Oh, Ruth. Look, I got the whole story on him the other night. I know, I know. He's a racketeer. He's no good. You told me all that. Well, doesn't that matter? Look, Ruth. I spend 50 weeks a year slaving in an office. My dates are usually a friend of my brother's or the boy next door. So? So this is a vacation. Two short weeks away from that endless, dull routine. I'm going to make the most of it. Hmm. With Al. Yes, with Al. It's fun to be with him. Exciting. Oh, sure, sure. We go to the best places. Everybody knows him. We get the best table. And listen to me a minute, will you? Well... I know how you feel. Believe me, I do. But just let me say something. Go ahead. When I was your age, a date with a guy like Al would have been exciting to me, too. But as you grow up, you learn things. Uh Uh-huh. You learn that fellows you pick up at a dance, at a summer resort, who act like big shots like Al, don't run one, two, six with that friend of your brother's or the boy next door. End of sermon. Oh, Ruthie, you're awfully sweet. But don't worry about me, will you? <laughs> oh, that must be Al now. Oh, 
Is Al Benton here? Uh, no. You expect him, don't you? Oh, yes. And I'll come in and wait. Well, I... And who's that? I don't know. What? Just the two of you here. What do you want? Al Benton. I told you he isn't here. I'll wait. Now, just a minute. Oh, hey, oh. you... I said I'll wait. In an FBI field office some ten miles from the lake resort, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. He is waiting, too. Waiting for a call from headquarters in Washington. Jim. Yes, Bob. What do you say about some dinner? No, you go ahead. I'm going to stick around here. Oh, something special? Yes, I'm waiting for a report from Washington. What about? Some fingerprints that I sent down there this morning. Oh. It's on that central bank holder. What's the story? Two men held up the cashier of the bank, took over $8,000. I see. The car they used was found about four hours later across the state line. Mm-hmm. What about the two men? One of them is still in the car. Good. Not so good. He was dead, shot through the heart. Yeah. Well, what about the money? No sign of it. Oh. Had there been any gunplay in the holdup? No. I believe he was killed by his partner. That's the usual loyalty of one thief to another. Yeah. Any identification? A dead man was named Johnson. At least that was one of his many aliases. Habitual criminal, long record. How about the one that got away? I've got a fair description on him, but I'm hoping for more than that. What do you mean? I picked up some prints in the car in the back of the rearview mirror. They weren't Johnson's. I checked on that. Those are ones you sent to Washington? Yeah, that's right. Well, Jimmy boy, I wish you luck. Uh, can I bring you back a sandwich? Oh, yes, will you? Ham and cheese on ride. Tastes fine. Okay. Coffee? Right. Anything else? Yes. Identification of those fingerprints. Mister. Yeah? Can I go in the kitchen? What for? I want to make some coffee. Stay where you are. Oh. Look, will you do us one favor? Will you put that gun away? Not till after I use it. Please. What is this all about? I told you I'm waiting for Al. Why? You'll see. You're going to shoot him, aren't you? That's right. Oh, no. C- couldn't you pick someplace else? No. Why not? Because I know he's coming here. What time is it? <sighs> Almost 9.15. He was due at 9? Yes. Well, remember what I told you. When he knocks, you answer the door. Ask him right in and don't rumble. No, I, I can't do it. You'd better, sweetheart, or all of you get it. Would you mind telling us why you want to kill him? No. Well? My brother and Al were partners. They pulled a stick up yesterday. Oh, after they'd done the job, Al knocked my brother off and beat it with the dough. How do you know all this? Grapevine. I even know he's planning a lamb on tonight and take this dame here with him. Anne, is that true? Yes. Oh. oh, but I didn't know anything about this other stuff. Honest, Ruth. Oh, baby, baby. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't answer that till I tell you what to do. If that's Al, tell him to come right over here. And don't give him no office that anything's wrong, understand? Yes. Okay, answer it. Hello? Is that you, Ann? Yes, Al? Look, baby, I got tied up here down at the inn. Let me send a cab up for you, huh? Well, We I... can leave from here. Uh, I'd rather not, Al. Huh? I, I'd rather you call for me. Well, it'll be another hour. Well, that's all right. Okay, see you later, honey. Bye. Goodbye. Is he coming? Yes. That's swell. One combination on rye coming up. Oh, thanks, Will. 
And here's your coffee. Good. All right, anything break? Yes, plenty. The report on those fingerprints came in right after you left. Swell. Were they identified? Yeah. Belonged to a small-time racketeer named Al Benton. Al Benton? Mm-hmm. Hey, that name is familiar. Well, we picked him up for questioning on that liquor hijacking case last year. You remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I dug his picture out, and Williams took it over to the central bank. He just called back. Clerks identified Benton as one of the two bandits. Oh, you have been moving. Well, that isn't all. There's more. Yes, I started a quick check on Benton. Found he'd been living in a hotel over on 12th Street. But he'd moved? Yes, over a month ago. They know where he's gone? Well, he didn't leave a forwarding address, but the hotel porter remembered shipping his trunk to an inn out at Lakeside. Yeah, that's the summer resort, isn't it? That's right. There are only two inns out there, and the first one I called told me that Mr. Al Benton was one of their guests. And all this happened while I was out to dinner? Well, that's the way it goes. You spend endless hours waiting and waiting, and then everything breaks at once. I suppose now you're heading for Lakeside. We're heading for Lakeside. What? You were so interested in the case, Bob, I had you assigned to it. Let's go. Hey, you. Huh? What is it? Sit down. Relax. Are you kidding? Sit down, I said. Okay. Look, look, I can't stand this much longer than this way. Now don't you start again. Well, I can't help it. I, I can't. don't want no tears going when he shows here. Leave her alone, please. What time is it now? Ten fifteen. You should be here. Mister. Yeah? I believe that what you told us about Al killing your brother is true. Uh-huh. Why do you try to settle the score? Turn him over to the police. Let the law settle it for you. I do this my way. Yeah, but... I don't want to hear no more about it. Wait. What's the matter? There's... There's the headlights of a car coming up the hill. That's your private road, ain't it? No other houses on it? No. Okay, this is it. Oh, no. Oh, Shut no. up. Now listen to me, both of you. When he knocks, and here answers the door. He's almost here. Listen, we we'll invite the guy to come right in. I'll take care of the rest. The car's out front. It stopped. Did you hear what I told you? Did you? Yes, yes. I'll have your girlfriend here with me. If you make the wrong move, it'll be just too bad for her. Uh, I'll I'll do what you say. Quiet. Just a minute. You're there. lying. <laughs> Lucky I saw him through the window. That's why I come in from the back. Turn in just a moment to tonight's FBI file. Now, our weekly series of questions and answers on education. First question. Do you have to be a college man or woman to be elected to Congress? No, of course not. Yet in both the Senate and the House of Representatives, four out of every five members have attended college. Four out of five, 80 percent. Think that over, father and mother. And then say to yourself, my children are not going to be denied the advantage of a college education. If you're really sincere in that resolution, only a small sum each week invested in an equitable educational fund will do it. Second question. 
What is an equitable educational fund? It is a life insurance plan that includes these important features. The equitable educational fund makes sure that money for education will be ready when your child is ready. If you die, the educational fund becomes fully established. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the educational fund continues to build up without any further payment. Educational costs are spread out over many years instead of being concentrated in a few. Last question. How much would it cost to send your son or daughter to college? That question is answered in a memorandum recently prepared for Equitable Society representatives. It tells the cost of tuition, board, and lodging in 192 leading American colleges. It summarizes the long-range opportunities open to educated men and women in 29 industries and professions, such as architecture, dentistry, engineering, chemistry, life insurance, social service, information every parent should have. Your nearest Equitable Society representative will be glad to show his copy to any sincerely interested parent. Call him tomorrow. You'll find him in the phone book under Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Night of Terror. There is little loss to the community when, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI... One hardened criminal does away with another. It is a case of one who lives by the sword, dying by the sword. But it is the business of law enforcement agencies to apprehend the murderer and bring him to the bar of justice. For here in the United States, it is the privilege of no one man to take the life of another. This is not a government of a person by a person and for a person, but of the people, by the people, and for the people. Tonight's file continues back at the lakeside cabin. The gangster who had waited for his intended victim is stretched out on the floor with a bullet through his head. The two terrified girls stand staring at the body. He... He's dead. That's right, baby. Al, you killed him. What else could I do? He was out to get me. Well, I'm calling the police. Now, wait a minute. We've been through enough tonight. Get away from that phone. No, no. Operator. Operator. Get away, I said. Oh, Al. This ain't no time to be calling cops. Let's hang up this phone and forget about it. You cheap hoodlum. And make your girlfriend behave, will you? Get out of here, Al. Huh? I said get out. Hey, what is this? We got a date, remember? I found out all about you tonight. What you really are. I don't want any part of it. Well, now, wait, baby. You keep away from me. Okay. Now will you go? Uh-uh. No dice, Al. You're coming with me anyway. Oh, no. Look, baby, you know too many things about me now. You're coming with me, your girlfriend, too. I'll make up my mind what to do with you along the way. That looks like the door to the lobby down there at the end of the porch. Right. I think Lakeside Inn has seen better days. Yeah. Here we are. Go ahead, Bob. Thanks. Well, this is certainly a busy place. Yes, if you like canaries. Do you suppose they could tell us where the proprietor is? Oh, there's a bell over there on the desk. That might be a help. Come on. Okay. All I did is stop the concert. Well, I'll try again. 
Coming, coming. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Are you in charge here? I'm the proprietor, yes. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Here are our credentials. Well, why are you here? We'd like to talk to one of your guests, a man named Al Benton. Oh, you're too late. What do you mean? He checked out of here just ten minutes ago. Where'd he go? I don't know, and to be frank with you, I don't care. I was very happy to see him leave. Why? He was a most unsavory person. I felt Did all he have along. a car, he... sir? Yes. Would anyone around here know where he was going? No. I... Oh, wait, wait a minute. Yes? I recall something about a girl he was going to meet. What? She lives in one of the cabins on the lake. Do you know her name? No, sir. Do you know which cabin? No, I don't. Where did you get this information? He ordered a taxi to be sent up for her, and then he changed his mind and went himself. Well, if he ordered the cab, he must have told the driver which cabin to go to. Say, that's right. I'll check with my phone operator. She put in the call. Excuse me, please. Surely. You know, Jim, if he left ten minutes ago, that's not too much of a start. No. We could still nail him at the girl's cabin. That is, if we could find out which cabin it is. That's right. Well, gentlemen, I believe I have the information you've been seeking. Good. The girl's name is Anne Madison. The cabin is less than a mile from here. Can you tell us how to get there? Yes. Follow the road out front as far as you can go. Well, in which direction? Oh, to the left. Thank you. The cabin is on the hill. There's a driveway leading up there. Thank you. Come on, Bob. Right here by the car, both of you. I'm dumping this body back here in the bushes. Ruthie. Yeah, honey? Do you think we should try to run away? Uh-uh. Not now. Not here. He's too quick with that gun. Oh, we'll never get away from him. Yes, we will. I hope you're right. Oh, Ruthie. Forgive me, please. Oh, for what? This terrible mess. It's all my fault. Look, we'll get out of it some way. I know. Shh, 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 shh. I want oh. you both to sit in front with me. Okay. And look, let's get a few things straight before we take off. We'll be passing other cars, other people, maybe cops. Don't try to tip them off about our little party. You'll both be sorry. Okay, get in. Go ahead, Anne. All right. Wait a minute. Hmm? A car down there at the foot of the hill just turned in your driveway. A car coming up here? Yeah. Oh, thank heaven. Now, listen, both of you. Wherever it is, I want you to get rid of them fast. I'll hide here in my car. If either one of you blow a whistle, this gun goes off. for Miss Ann Madison. I'm Ann Madison. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh? We were informed that a Mr. Al Benton was on his way up here to see you. Al Benton? That's right. Do you know him? Well, i uh, sure she knows him and he's here. Ruth! What? Look, we've been looked around enough. If you want Al Benton, he's right oh, Look out! Al, Anybody hurt? No. Is Benton in that car? Yes. Come on, Pop. Don't seem to be gaining on him. I know. This road would only straighten out. I'd get a shot at one of his tires. I think it does after this bend. Now, I'll try it now. Too high. He's turning left out to the peninsula. Stay with him. Can't even see him now. Wait till we get up over this hill. You know, Jim, if I remember right, there's a fork in the road up ahead. Yes, there it is. And no bend all. Which turn should we take? Quick, Jim. Uh, turn right. I still don't see him. Keep going. I have a pretty good hunch this is the road he would take. Is that the municipal airport up ahead? That's it. Hey, look, there's his car now. Turn him to the airport gate. My hunch was right. I figured he'd head for here and try to get a plane out. Uh huh. Give it everything you've got, Bob. We've got to stop him before he does board a plane. Flight number six, Bob 
Well, yeah, Jim. We're going to have to be pretty careful in this one. Oh, the guns, you mean? That's right. There's too many people here. Well, look. We... Wait. What? Do you see him? Yes. There he is up there by gate four. Come on. Oh, Bobby's seen us. Yep. He's running through the gate. Let's step on it. Don't you think we should alert the field? We haven't got time. I don't see him. No. Maybe headed for those hangars over there. We couldn't get to them that fast. What do we do, Jim? We can't lose him now. I know, I know. Wait a minute. What? Look out there. There he is running across the field. Oh, yeah. Look at that fool. There's a plane taking off. Oh, he doesn't see it. He's running right across its path. What? Bert, look out! Right into the propeller. Pretty awful. Yes. Well, I'd say the file on Al Benton is closed. The panic flight of Al Benton, which resulted in his violent death, saved the state the trouble of prosecuting him for first degree murder. Your FBI is a business organization, and its business is the apprehension of criminals. The fact that there are 130,000 major crimes committed every month in this country does not indicate any laxity on the part of your FBI. It merely indicates that the same passions that have governed the lives of men down through the years are still vibrant. The same greed... The same lust for power, the same love of ill-gotten gain. When man loses those characteristics, crime will disappear from the earth. But until that time, your FBI will continue to operate as it has been operating. As a faithful servant, protector of the American people. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Again, let me remind you to check with your Equitable Society representative about the safest and wisest investment a parent can make for his children, an Equitable Educational Fund. Without obligation, he will show you the Equitable Society's memorandum on the costs of higher education and some of the opportunities it opens. You'll find your Equitable Society representative in the phone book under the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Curious Coin Collector. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is written and produced by Jerry Devine. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Coin Collector on This Is Your FBI. This Sunday marks the end of daylight saving time for those communities that have been observing it. If your community returns to standard time, this is your FBI, will be brought to you next week at exactly the same time you heard it tonight. If your community is now on standard time, tune in one hour later next week. That's Case Closed for this week. You can find more from Rogue's Gallery, This Is Your FBI, past episodes of Case Closed, and all the other Relic Radio podcasts 
including thousands of other old-time radio episodes at the website relicradio.com. And while you're there, if you donate, you'll help support this and all of the shows, help keep them coming every week, or visit donate.relicradio.com to find out more information on that. Thank you, as always, to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. I'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Case Closed.